Let's turn to Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3 and... Just before we read that, uh, can I just ask those who have God's people to make a point of coming to the prayer meeting uh, and coming to the prayer meeting regularly, but especially this Thursday night, what I'm speaking on, as I have studied it this week, I do believe it's something God's people need to hear. And there's no point people sitting at home if you're not heard. But come to God's house Thursday night. We're going through the book of Ephesians, and it's these verses, verse 30 of chapter 4. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So much, only three short verses, but so much, and I believe the Lord is much to teach us and say so I would encourage you if you can be there please come and ask the Lord to speak to each of our hearts and that the Lord will really teach us through his precious word Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 1 and it says and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and eternal Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks and praise for this service. We thank thee, Lord, for each one gathered in the house of God. We give thee great thanks and praise for the reason we're here today. It's because of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God's people are here to worship him. They're here to seek to hear his voice, to gain instruction, to live according to his will. And Lord, we thank thee even, Lord, for those who have gathered with us this morning and yet know not Christ. We pray, O Lord, that in God's house I will speak to them. We pray that not one will leave this gathering without hearing the speaking voice of God. We pray, O Lord, that thou will open our hearts to the truths of God's precious word. We live in a world where man measures himself by man. But we pray, O Lord, we will measure ourselves by the word of God. And even this church, Lord, will measure itself not by other denominations or by other churches. But, Lord, we will come to God's precious word. And we will measure ourselves by thy revealed will. And, Lord, if there's that which needs to be put right, we pray, O Lord, that thou will give us the grace to do it. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that in this church we will know what it is to be faithful. And, O Lord, we acknowledge that that is not within man himself to be able to do that. But we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt send thy Holy Spirit. We thank thee that all the help we need comes from God. And we pray, O Lord, and thank thee for not only establishing this church, but we pray you will cause this church to endure. And we pray, O Lord, you will cause it to go forward and you will cause it to grow. And we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt cause it to shine brightly for thee. We're living in a wicked world. We're living in a very dark world. And any true light that shines will be seen very clearly. And we ask you, O Lord, that we will not be tarnished, not be sullied by the world, but help us to walk in the paths of righteousness and in the way of purity. We ask you, O Lord, that for each church member of this congregation, you will cause them to be faithful to the vows that they have taken with regard to this church, 
that they will support it, that they will pray, that they will seek to serve the Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will give them the grace to do that and that we will work together with unity. We pray for the oversight of this church. And Lord, what a solemn responsibility to be given. We pray that each man will know the unfilling of the wisdom of God. And Lord, as he makes its decisions, that they will be done in unity with the Spirit of God. And we pray, Lord, this morning, that will take away all distractions, open the Word of God to us, make it real, make it the message of God to our hearts today. And may we leave different, may we leave desiring more of God and more of our Saviour. For we ask in Jesus' name, empty me of self and sin, I pray. Fill me with thy Spirit and help me to deliver thy Word to the glory of thy name. For Christ's sake, I pray these things. Amen. It's nothing when a church begins to compromise. Of course, in doctrine, that's a, an awful thing. Whenever they compromise in doctrine, they no longer become the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they compromise in duty and failing to tell others about the Savior, when they compromise in discipline and they fail to exercise discipline within a congregation, that's an awful thing because that's compromise. And we must pray that as a church and as a congregation, the Lord will not allow us to compromise. Because when compromise comes into a church, then the church is weakened. The testimony of the Lord is weakened. And the honor of the Lord is tarnished in the land. Whenever someone claims to be of Christ and they do the opposite of what Christ commands, well then the name of the Lord suffers. In the first church that we uh, studied in the book of Revelation chapter 2, the book of Ephesus, Ephesus, the Lord desired a church that was in love with Christ. And then the second church, Smyrna, he desired a faithful church. Third church, Pergamos, the Lord desired purity of doctrine. In the fourth church, Thyatira, the Lord desires purity of life. And in this fifth church, in this letter to the church at Sardis, the Lord desires spirit-filled service. Spirit-filled service. If you're saved this morning, you are saved to serve. Now, there's not one of us are called to do that in the same way. There's an individual service for you. There's an individual service for me. You will reach people I won't reach. I'll reach people you won't reach. But the Lord has saved us to serve, to be witnesses where he has placed us. And we're not to become tarnished by the world. We're to be different from the world. We're to stand out for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to look at this letter this morning because it does contain for us some warnings of what it is for a church not to be faithful to the calling that the Lord has called it to. First one says, Unto the angel or the minister of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Now once again we come to the description of the Lord Jesus Christ of himself. And as we looked at these descriptions really at the opening line of the letter to each of the churches, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God-man, our Savior, is greater than man in every single one of his attributes. When you look at Christ, you find he is greater. Man has a degree of wisdom but well, Christ is all wisdom. Man is a degree of holiness, but Christ is all holiness. Man is a degree of God-given power, but God has all power. We're also taught that the Lord is a provider for man in all his need because of who he is. And God provides our needs. That's a wonderful truth, a very simple thing to say. But whenever a Christian grasps that, oh, they can live then in a higher plane because they're not trying to fix things in their own lives, but they're running to the Lord and the Lord meets our need. And what a wonderful blessing it is to live with that reality. God is supplying my need. I'm reaching out my hand because he said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Sadly today, many seek to minimize God, to bring him down to a human level in order that man will accept him. And in doing that, they present the Lord as nothing more than just another friend, a companion. When the character of God is not presented faithfully, then man is never convinced of the fact that he's a sinner. When you don't declare God's holiness and majesty, man will never know he's a sinner. Sinners see no need for the Lord, him they hear about, because he's been brought down to man's level. And sometimes Christians, they don't see the need to run to the Lord, because God just seems to be a friend, nothing more, nothing less. Here we have a wonderful statement 
a wonderful statement that we ought to underline in our word that should cause every Christian to run to the Lord and seek the provision of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ describes himself as he that hath the seven spirits of God. And that ought to be a great comfort and encouragement to each child of God in this house this morning. Now the number seven is the number of fullness completion and perfection in scripture we find it on the seventh day god rested from his labors because creation was finished in the seventh year the hebrew slave was to be free because he had completed his time of captivity and service and every seventh year was a sabbatical year for the people of israel and therefore this description is simply a way of saying that the lord jesus christ has the fullness of the Holy Spirit and he sends it forth to his people from God the Father. Now that's what the Lord said he would do. He said, I will send a comforter, the Spirit, unto you. And we're going to turn back just to note in John chapter 14 exactly what he said about that. John chapter 14, verse number 26 And the Lord is speaking to his disciples and he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now what does that teach us about the Holy Ghost and the presence of the Holy Ghost in a church or in a people or in a person? It teaches us that the teaching and the work of the Holy Spirit has a direct relationship with the words of Of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, how does the Lord speak to his people? He speaks through his word. And therefore, whenever the Holy Spirit is working in a ministry and in a people, then they will be brought to the word of God. They'll be brought to the words of the Lord. It won't be new revelation because God has given all we need for salvation or sanctification or glorification. But they will always bring us to the word of God. And you will find that whenever the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they were able to refer back to things that happened in the life of the Lord that they didn't understand at the time. An example of that is whenever the Lord described himself as a temple. We find that they did not understand that until the Lord rose again. Until the Spirit gave them the understanding about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ being the temple of God. And then we find over the page in chapter 15 of John, verses 26 and 27, when the Comforter is come, and I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, he shall, test, he shall proceed from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then again we find that the Holy Spirit reveals unto us the person of Christ. You know, men ought not to leave a Holy Spirit-filled meeting speaking about the preacher or speaking about a person. They ought to leave speaking about Christ. They ought to leave rejoicing in Christ, being thrilled because of what Christ has done, not because what a man has done. And then we find another thing in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 33. And in Acts 2, 33, it says, and Peter is preaching here in the day of Pentecost, the Spirit has come, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and that's speaking of Christ, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. In other words, what happened on the day of Pentecost was the teaching of what should happen when the Holy Spirit comes. Now, there were special things that happened before the completion of God's word, and they were able to speak in different languages. But there are things that still happen today when the Holy Spirit is there. The sending forth of the Holy Ghost will result in people empowered in a special way for service. The man and woman who has not had Bible college training can be equipped by God to be a witness. You can go into your work and be a witness. And the Lord will give you the power to say that which is necessary to speak to the heart of your friends, to your family, to stand at the front of a children's meeting, to go among the senior citizens and speak there. And the Lord gives you special power to minister for him when he calls you to do a work. Not only that, when the Holy Spirit comes, we'll find Christians witnessing for the cause of Christ. 
You know, there are many Christians today and many groups today and they come out and they minister for everything but the cause of Christ. It's about a social gospel. What can you get? They don't preach Christ. They don't promote Christ. And that's what happens whenever the Holy Spirit comes. Christ alone was preached. His birth, his death, his resurrection. Not only that, there was a great focus on the word of God. Because whenever you read down that sermon, you'll find that on at least three occasions, Peter refers to quotes from the Old Testament. In Psalms and in Micah. And you'll find that he refers to the Old Testament and brings forth the word of God. You see, that is in line with what Christ said. That the Holy Spirit will bring us to the word of God. Then when the Holy Spirit comes, there is conviction and conversion among the unsaved. It says in verse number 37, that when they heard this, they were pricked or convicted in their hearts and said, what shall we do? And we find then verse 41, they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then we find something else. And this is very important. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes, the saved are obedient. How do I know that? Because in verses 42 right through to 47, they continued steadfastly. In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, you go right down that list and you'll find that what you're reading is a group of Christians who are obedient to what God has called them to be. And you know, you don't find that very often whenever the Holy Spirit is preached. People sometimes want to talk about signs and wonders and marvelous things. You know what one of the greatest signs and wonders and marvelous things is? When a person is saved by the grace of God and obedient to the word of God. There's no denying that that's of the Lord. Because humanly speaking, no one can be obedient to the word of God unless the spirit of God is within them. And there's no greater sign and wonder in this day and certainly in this wicked world than a godly Christian. Than a man or woman, a boy or girl living for the Lord. And because the fullness of the Holy Spirit comes through Christ then we must ask him for the Holy Spirit's control more and more of our lives. And that's what we mean by being filled by the Spirit. It simply means that the Spirit has control of us. He is guiding us. We are obedient to us. We are being obedient to him. More and more of our life is being surrendered day by day. That's sanctification. That's what it means to be filled by the Spirit. We pray for that continual filling. Lord, save us from ourselves. And help us to follow the Lord through the Spirit of God. And that is what the disciples were taught to pray. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Have you asked for the Holy Spirit today? Christian man or woman, Christian boy or girl, have you asked for the Holy Spirit to be your power today, to be your guide today, to be your wisdom today, to be your fullness today? Have you asked, well, the Lord is ready and willing to give. If you will ask, perhaps that's the reason we struggle so much. Because we don't ask for the provision that is there and ready. One of the old Puritans said, there's a treasure store inexhaustible and riches unsearchable for both pastor and people. And thank God there is today. There's more than we need. And thank God he never diminishes in his giving. What do you need today in your service for the Lord? Are you weary? And we can get weary in the work of God. Is there confusion in your life about the next step you have to take, the next decision you have to make? Is there fear about a task you've been called to do, whether the people you have to face or the actual task? Is there apathy? Can you honestly say before the Lord this morning, it just seems to be a struggle all the time to come to church and to pray and to read God's word. I'm just apathetic at the moment. Perhaps it's a lack of results or disappointment in your service and that's a, a struggle for you. Perhaps you feel underappreciated. You do a lot of work. A lot of work maybe even for this congregation and people don't see because it's behind the scenes and perhaps you feel that nobody really appreciates this. Perhaps you feel unable to complete the task that you've been called to. The only one who can meet those needs is the Lord. The only one who can meet those needs is the Lord. If you're weary this morning, I can say, well, keep going, it'll be worth it all. But rather than that, the words of man, I can give you the word of God, which says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. You see, God's words and commands also come with blessings and promises. And if you're weary, go to the word and see what God says to the weary. Come on to me, all ye are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Those are better than my words because they're God's words. 
If you're making a decision today, you don't need the wisdom of man. You need the voice of God. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Those are better words than the words of man. If you have a fear about a task you've been called to, I can say, well, try your best. We're behind you. But the Lord says, fear ye not, for I am with thee. And that's better because you can stand upon that and you can hold that and you can go forward with those promises. And every single thing I've mentioned there, there's an answer in the word of God. God alone can provide that which you need. Your need will be met in Christ. He has perfect power and perfect ability. And therefore, he is our source for help in the work of God. And in living for the Lord. We have a wonderful saviour this morning. Never diminish him. But always exalt him. Don't ask little things of God. Ask great things of God. Don't have a little faith in the Lord. Have great faith in the Lord. Because what he has promised to do. He is able to provide. And then we find that in Revelation chapter 3. Not only is he described. As the one who has the seven spirits of God. But the seven stars. And again. The thought of seven is a thought of completeness, perfection, fulfillment. The Lord will provide the necessary amount of men to go through this world to bring the gospel that each of those for whom Christ has died will be saved. The Lord is still today calling men into the work of God, calling women into the work of God. And thank the Lord for that because his work is going forward. There are missionaries today in lands because God has called them. We're living in the day of God completing his work upon this earth. And the fact is this, that the seven stars, and we have read earlier, I think it's chapter number one, the seven stars are in the right hand of God. And that's a very special place to be because that speaks to us of a position of authority. The right hand is the hand of authority. And God's servants who preach his word are in a position of authority. Now, often you hear the statement, You don't have the right to say that. That offends me. Who gave you the authority to say that? Well, the gospel minister has his authority from the Lord Jesus Christ to say everything that's found in Scripture. Now, he's to say nothing more than it's found in Scripture. He's certainly to say nothing less, but it's the whole authority of heaven to preach God's word as has been revealed and given between Genesis and Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. And if you've been called to a work today, and if you have been called to preach God's word, whether it be children or adults, it is being sent by the Lord. And therefore you have the authority to stand and proclaim and declare and herald the word of God. And not only that, we find that when the Lord said, even so send I you, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. The Lord did not send his people out without the power to fulfill the service. And the power is available this morning if we will simply but ask. And not only do we have Authority in that position, but we also have security and protection. You know, there are many people who would love to see God's servants silenced. We know that today. We're fighting a battle, not least the devil. And we must remember that the devil is like a roaring lion. And that picture reminds us that the roaring lion, in a state of excitement and going after the prey, is not content till it's dead. And the devil's desire. For God's servants is that they would be dead. But we're in the hand of God. And nothing can harm us. Because God's protection is upon us. And only when the Lord gives his authority. For the soul to be released from the body. Will any servant of God. Go home to glory. And thank the Lord for that. Because it's a fearful thing in many ways to walk. And proclaim the things of God. And know that the devil is against you. And know he desires your destruction. And know that there are many people by their lips to desire your destruction. But thank the Lord, if we look at our position, we are in the right hand of God. And therefore, there's not only authority, but praise God, there's security. And there is protection. And not only that, because of that position, there's authority, there's security. But there's also great responsibility. There's a great responsibility. And you know, the ministry isn't a career. And it's not just a job. But it is a calling. It's God's calling. And therefore, we must fulfill God's will and in a responsibility that we have to proclaim God's message, not our own message. And any man who stands 
and calls himself a minister of the Lord and proclaims any other message than what is found in the word of God is not a messenger of God. He is in a job. He's in a career. But he's not in the work of God. Because God's work alone is to proclaim the truth and the word of God. And we'll see the danger of a man not proclaiming the truth in the word of God as we go down here. Because it says, I know thy works. That thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Thou hast a name. Thou hast a reputation. And as people walk past your church and they see the activity, they think there's lots of things going on. They must be getting on well. The Lord must be blessing there. And it seems to be that this church were rather content with the praise of society around them. They were concerned about the opinions of man and the perceptions of man. But, you know, man's perception of God's work isn't the final measuring tape. God is his standard for his work. Now, godly men are used of God to give advice and to help steer the work. But remember, it's the Lord's opinion not to be the one that concerns us. What does God think? How does God see our church in view of biblical revelation how do we stand as a church do we need to change things do we need to confess things do we need to repent of things this is what we need to do we need to come to God's word and see say is that thou livest see this church may have been full of activity may have, health, may have had healthy finances maybe a great number of people maybe different types of people maybe high up people maybe lower down people There certainly seems to be much going on in the church to cause people to think that there was much life within. But here's what the Lord says, in spite of everything, in spite of busyness, in spite of activity, in spite of programs, thou art dead. Thou art dead. Now what a solemn rebuke from the Lord. But Lord, we're a church and we're trying to serve thee. And we're doing what we think is right and what is good. But the Lord's view of this church is simply this. Thou art dead. You're useless. Something that is dead is useless. And there was a church here that once was faithful, but now it is literally useless. Now one of the Bible commentators said, was it not shameful? Utterly inexcusable, considering that all the provision is found in Christ, that he describes this church as dead. Now, why was it dead? Well, most Bible commentators believe that in the church there were those who were not saved, and yet they were engaged in works within the church. An example of that would be having an unsaved person teaching Sunday school, an unsaved person being an elder and handing out communion. And that would be an example of someone who is dead spiritually working in a church. And that is not the Lord's desire. Those who teach the word must be saved. Those who lead the work must be saved. Also, those who were saved, it seems to be in this congregation, were indistinguishable from the unsaved. In other words, there was no difference between the saved and the lost. Instead of influencing the world around them for good, the world around them had influenced the church, and the church was indistinguishable from the world. And because of that, they had no power. They had no influence. They had no effect. They were dead. They were useless. They had just become another social club, another religion that other people attended. And that is not God's desire for his church. God's desire for his church is that it is set on fire and that it burns brightly with the gospel. They were failing to be faithful in the community in which they lived. And the reality is, even if they were doing it with full sincerity, anything they did was half-hearted because their heart wasn't right with God. Even if they did it to the best degree of their ability, it still was half-hearted. And the Lord asks his people to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. What about you this morning? Is there someone in the congregation, one of God's people, and once coming over that hill, your soul was thrilled and you just couldn't wait to get over and meet the people of God and sing the praises of God and hear the word of God and stay and talk about the things of God after the services. And yet today it was everything to get out of bed and to come to church. And if truth be told, you could rather not be here, but 
to cause people coming after you to see what's your own, you're coming and putting up the show. Is that your heart this morning? Friend, that's not how the Lord desires you to live. There's fullness in Christ. There's joy in coming to the house of God when you're walking with the Lord. And sadly, your testimony cannot be used if you're not in the place where God desires you to be, in the center of his will, walking with him. And see, this brings us back once again to the basic problem. Christ wasn't exalted. Christ wasn't loved. And when Christ is not loved or exalted in the church, then the church becomes very man-centered. And when a church is man-centered, it's no use for the gospel. What was said to the people who were living their lives like that, the church that was like that, the minister who was in charge of the church like that, says in verse number two, be watchful. Be watchful. Strengthen the things that, which remain that are ready to die. That word watchful means keep awake. Keep awake. Keep watch. Be vigilant. In other words, just don't float on. Don't go with the flow. Don't just accept the norm of society, but be vigilant. Watch carefully. Measure the doctrines that are taught by the word of God. Measure the practices that are engaged in by the word of God. God's word is to be central. Now that word, watchful, comes from a word meaning to get up from sitting or lying or get up from your disease, rise up from the disease or the death or decay. And it means figuratively, stop your inactivity and get out of the ruins of what is remaining and rise up and stand up and do something. And that is what that word means. So the church were just sitting on their laurels, sitting on their past. We have a great history. We have a great testimony. And therefore, we'll just float along right now. No, the church always needs to be active in every decade, in every generation, every Sunday. Now, be watchful. Whose responsibility is it to be watchful? Whose responsibility is it to be watchful for the purity of the church? Well, I believe there are several answers. The first one, of course, is um, the fact that the watch is linked with the watchman, the one whose responsibility it was in days of old to stand upon the city walls, look out for danger, look out for enemies. And when they saw them approaching, to sound the alarm, to blow the trumpet, to let the people in the city know that danger was coming, that they might be prepared to fight against the enemy. And of course, that spiritual responsibility is given in measure to ministers of the gospel and those who preach God's word. They are watchmen. You'll find in Ezekiel, and the chapter number 3, and verse number 17, these words, that the Lord said, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I shall say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hands. Now, when we think of those verses, we remember this. It says, son of man. In other words, God uses men, simple human, frail creatures, to proclaim his word. He uses human instruments. Secondly, we notice the source of the message because it says, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Hear the word at my mouth. Therefore, we have to be listening for the voice of God. We're living in a world that is filled in so many ways with many voices and many opinions and many teachings. And we need very close to the Lord to hear the voice of God. Come to the word of God. Hear what God says. And then there's a great solemnity here because we are dealing with issues of life and death. Whenever a minister preaches, he's dealing with issues of life and death because it says there, if you do not warn the wicked... To save his life, that man shall die. And his blood will I require at your hands. And I have to confess, I don't understand how at funeral services, when there's a congregation of people who are going to live for a limited number of time, number of years, how any man can stand up or woman in front of that congregation and just say, God loves you. We're on our way to heaven. And there are men and women who are heartbeat from hell. Because God's word tells us their blood will be required at their hands. And that's why it's a very solemn thing to preach God's word. It's a very solemn thing to stand and deliver the word of God. 
Because we must be faithful. Can you imagine what would have been thought of the watchman upon the tower if the city had been attacked because he was sleeping? Or he saw the enemy coming and he didn't bother to do anything. The people would reel against him. In fact, in those times, it's most likely that he'd been stoned to death. What will be the cry of the damned against ministers who never once told men and women or boys and girls who need to be saved? Now, thinking about that, you as God's people need to pray for ministers. You need to pray that they be faithful, that they be honourable, because the message is a warning message. The failure to heed the message, the warning that God's judgment is coming, is damning. You ignore the message that there is a soul that needs to be saved, that there's a hell that needs to be shunned, there's a saviour who needs to be trusted, and you sin that must be repented of. You ignore that message, you die at your peril. But we've been faithful. A failure to preach this message is deplorable, and it seems that's exactly what was happening in this place. History tells us that in the very city of Sardis, it was in two parts, and one of the parts was on top of a very steep mountain side, and there wasn't very much room for expansion, so it was just a little bit of the city where the rulers lived up there, and the rest lived down in the plain in the valley where the food was grown. And about 2015 BC, there was a man who was running away from his enemies, and he came to the city of Sardis, and he thought, I'll be safe there. And he went into the city, and he believed it was so safe because of the steep walls and the steep cliff that nobody could climb up. And you know what he did? Instead of setting somebody and watch, instead of looking out to see if there was an enemy, he went to sleep. And as he was sleeping, the soldiers scaled the wall, and they came in and they murdered the man. And I believe that whenever this little phrase was read out in the church and Sardis, be watchful, their minds went back to their history. And you know, those who do not learn from their mistakes and their past and their history, repeat it. And here is what the Lord is saying. Don't be sleeping. Don't be resting thinking everything's okay. I've called you to a work. I've called you to a job. And you're to be faithful. And you know what the result is. It's death if you're not faithful. This is a responsibility of the preacher. But secondly, it's a responsibility of the elders. And that's why an eldership is established in the church. It's a biblical principle found in the book of Acts. They're established under a presbytery. And the elders have the responsibility to be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. And if you're in this congregation and an elder ever comes and taps you on the shoulder and says, I'm concerned, you ought to get down on your knees and thank the Lord that there's somebody concerned for your soul. How awful would it be if they saw you going astray or starting to do something that they knew was going to lead you away from the Lord and they said nothing and they didn't bother. If someone comes and speaks to you about your soul, I think that's something we ought to be very thankful for. The Lord's been very gracious in giving us saved men in the eldership. And once again, you ought to pray for them. But can I say, it's not only the responsibility of the minister and it's not only the responsibility of the elders, but it's the responsibility of the members of the congregation to make sure that there is, they're engaged in works that will contribute to the purity, effectiveness, and the testimony of the church. Now, how, what do we mean by that? Well, if there's going to be a pure testimony in the church, well, then you as a Christian need to be living in a godly manner. One of the worst testimonies of a church is whenever people are living in a worldly manner. Against the ways of God. What an awful thing if somebody can turn around and say, well, I won't go in there because he or she goes there. And do you know the life they live? Do you know the business person they are? You couldn't trust them. They're fighting among themselves. We couldn't go there. And that is how people talk. The testimony of the Lord is to be a faithful one. And sometimes that remains, it means you have to forgive and forget and get over things. That the work of God might go forward. And we need to pray that that would be the case. Not only that, but by personal devotion. You are helping the work of the Lord when you go into your closet on a daily basis and you read God's word and you pray. 
You're helping the work of the Lord because you are keeping close to the Lord and you're a source of blessing and you're a source of encouragement in the church when you do that. And you'll find it's when you stop reading and stop praying and stop the personal devotion that then there become issues in your work with the Lord and with all their believers. Attendance is another way in which you can ensure the purity and the effectiveness of the church. At the very least, it's a witness to your neighbours. It's amazing whenever you're speaking to people indoors and they'll say things like, well, I know they're saved next door because they go to church every Sunday. Folks, that's a testimony that there's a God whom you love. There's a Lord whom you give your day to, that you're going to worship with the people of God, attendance at the house of the Lord. And there's also another reason. It's part of the reason I made the announcement at the very start about coming to the prayer meeting. Because while it's the minister's responsibility to make sure he studies the word of God and prepares a message of the word of God and delivers the word of God, it's your responsibility to be there to hear it. If you're sitting in your home, the minister's been faithful, but if you haven't heard it, then you're missing out. And we especially would encourage people and compel people that they aren't neglectful in their duties. As God's people, but they come to the house of God, to the prayer meeting, and especially a prayer meeting because in that meeting we preach to God's people with Christian application from God's word. And we need this. We do need this. I need it. You need it. We need to come to God's word and see what is God saying to me. And therefore we need to also pray. As God's people, pray for your ministers, pray for your elders, pray for your members, and pray for the works. And finally, as my little thought, I'll just finish with this. It says, strengthen the things which remain. Now that word strengthen means to turn resolutely in a certain direction. There are people who are saved, but they're not walking right. And the idea is this, that they are to be strengthened or they're turned back onto the paths of righteousness again. How do we do that? How do we do that? Do you go and you point the finger and say, you're wicked, you're sinful? Well, actually, that's not the biblical way. The biblical way is this. You preach Christ. You preach the beauty of holiness. You preach the exaltation of the Lord, the fullness of God, the Spirit. And the Lord's people will be spoken to through the word of God. I don't need to point out your individual personal sins. The Holy Spirit will do that. But I need to preach Christ exalted. Christ glorified. And the fullness of living in Christ. Thank God whenever a preacher does that. And the Holy Spirit applies that. Then people are changed. Child of God this morning. If you are not living how you ought to be living. Confess it to the Lord. Get right with God. You know what's between you and the Lord. If you're not saved this morning, friend, you need to be saved. Week after week, watch men stand in this pulpit. They tell you that there's danger coming. Perhaps you've grown so used to it, it just runs over your head. One day you'll hear the message for the final time. And then you'll face the judgment that is coming. I trust and pray this morning that if you're not saved, you will come. And put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, we do thank thee for the work of this congregation. We thank thee, Lord, for thy goodness in raising it up. We thank you for the faithfulness of the founding members. We thank you, Lord, for the work that has been done. Many in this congregation, including myself, have been saved because of its witness. And we thank thee for that, Lord. And we pray that many more will be saved. We pray, O Lord, that you'll continue to save the young and the old. We pray families in this community will be saved and brought into the house of God. But thank you for those you have brought to us in recent days. Thank you for those members who have recently joined in membership of this congregation. Use them, Lord. Bless them. Make them faithful members. And for those, Lord, who are not saved, all work in their hearts, we pray. We ask you, Lord, that they'll not be content to sit in the house of God without the Saviour. But, O oh Lord, that they will come and find Christ and find him to everything he's promised to be and more. Lord, I pray that you'll bless God's people today. Keep us in the attitude of prayer. Lord, give us that desire to commit ourselves to pray for the evening service, that men and women, boys and girls might hear words where they can be saved. Send thy spirit, we pray. 
and glorify thy dear Son, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.